I used to be so excited about making e-commerce and digital as experiential as possible. But the reality is we just want to get in and get out if we're virtual, because a lot of times it's a convenience type purchase or it's a research oriented type purchase. And we want a retailer to facilitate both of those desires for us. So consistency really matters. You're listening to Retail Remix, your inside access to candid conversations with the people shaping retail's future. Here's your host, Alicia Esposito. All right, everyone, we're really excited for today's episode because it is the official kickoff of our Retail Innovation Conference and Expo guest series. As you may have seen, we're going to Chicago this May for our event, and we have quite a lineup of incredible speakers from analysts to experts and, of course, retail practitioners. Of that group, we have Melissa Minkow, who's Director of Retail Strategy at CINT, and she's going to be on stage interviewing Indochino CEO and President Drew Green. The brand has been on a significant growth trajectory, so she's going to interview him about that omni-channel roadmap, how they're keeping their brand mission alive as they expand across product lines and channels, and... Honestly, I think she's the right person for the job because day in and day out, Melissa studies all things omni-channel and retail strategy. In fact, on today's episode, we're digging into some of her findings from the firm's Connected Retail Report. This is the second year the company is doing it, and she has some incredible findings about the evolution of omni-channel how consumers assess brands and determine which ones they're loyal to. Listen in because there are definitely some interesting takeaways this time around. Melissa, so good to finally have you on the show. Thanks for being here with me. Thanks for having me. It's been a long time coming. I know, I know. Years at this point. (laughs) Obviously, I know you pretty well at this point. But for those listening that don't know you and don't know the work that you do with CINT, why don't we start there? Share a little bit about your, maybe even your past history in retail and what you do now as director of retail strategy. Sure. So I got my start in retail, actually, I mean, technically during high school as a sales associate for anthropology which was a great discount for someone who loves their clothing so much, right? (laughs) But after college, I ended up at Target and I was on the Target Canada team as a merchandise presentation business analyst for almost two years. I ended up leaving there for a small company called Iconoculture, which was actually owned by a larger company called Corporate Executive Board. But what I was doing for them was just retail advising and consulting for all the big retail companies that you know and love today or the ones that are still around, which is most of them for sure. And then Gartner actually bought Corporate Executive Board. So my role there changed quite a bit through that integration. And what that looked like was I was still a consultant for retailers, but I ended up being more on the omni-channel side. So more on the digital side, actually, really emphasizing e-commerce, social commerce, and multi-channel marketing strategy. So I was there for almost six years. Then I was briefly at a pharmaceutical market research company doing primary market research with healthcare providers to optimize the customer experience for healthcare providers and for patients. And then CINT brought me over because they had been a client of mine at Gartner actually, did an advisory call for them on chatbots, a very niche thing a couple of years ago. And I am the director of retail strategy for them. And what we do is we are global digital specialists. So that can mean a lot of things because we do do so many different types of projects for retailers. But ultimately, our core strengths really lie in designing CDPs for retailers, e-commerce and omni-channel customer experiences for retailers, consumers, and then also cloud migration for retailers. And, And we also play with life sciences brands and financial services brands and CPG companies and media companies as well. But I sit in our retail practice 
really just navigating the marketplace and making sure that our offering aligns with what retailers need to accommodate consumers today. That's great. I love that you adapt your offerings based on what you're hearing from the market. And I know a big part of your work is research and analysis, kind of assessing what retailers are doing, what their strategies are, and identifying gaps or most importantly, opportunities. And I know one of your landmark pieces of research is your connected retail report. Last year was the first year. And I know we had the chance to work on a webinar together, which was a lot of fun about it. So why don't you share a little bit about your intentions for the research for those, again, who are new to CINT and the work that you do and what the overall process is like. I love hearing the inside scoop on how, you know, <laughs> firms think about research and how they craft everything, which is such a nerdy thing to say, but you know, so fun, I, I would love to hear how you break it down. Yeah, for sure. So the intention behind the research is really to put a face or faces to the name Omnichannel. Omnichannel is such a buzzword in the retail space, as you know, and because of how long it's been a buzzword in the industry, it's taken on so many different shapes that I think even retailers really struggle to define what Omnichannel looks like from the consumer perspective. There's all these ideas behind, okay, it's connecting the dots between digital and physical and having a strong approach there. But in terms of what that actually means for a consumer and how they're able to shop and making that path to purchase really accommodating and convenient, but also experiential, that's what we wanted to do was say, okay, who are the retailers that are actually doing that? And how can we also, as a firm, define omni-channel in a unique, differentiating way, but one that also aligns with the industry and what could be beneficial to our retail clients so that they could actually understand, okay, these are the changes we need to be making to our strategy and our approach with consumers to make sure that we're really winning them back time and time again. So that was the intention behind the research was just to clarify for the marketplace what omnichannel actually means because I really get frustrated when I hear terms repeated. My background is really in marketing, right? Like undergrad and graduate and marketing degrees. And you'll hear things like authenticity and organic and you just don't know what it actually ends up meaning for a brand. So omni-channel has become one of those words and it's so important in retail. And I actually don't think that it's an outdated term by any means. I think we just need to have a clear definition behind it. And that was why we designed this research. So I'm glad you agree with that. It sounds like you're in alignment with how frustrating yeah, it is. Yeah, no, I, I totally. And it's funny because you have the consumer component of the research. So I felt like that taking a minute to align and be clear on definition and expectations is really important because like the retail industry is rarely consistent or clear on like how we define omni-channel. So how can we expect consumers to be? So folks who download the research, you'll, you'll see like there is a clear you know, set in stone, like this is how we're defining it and this is how we were communicating omni-channel to the consumer side, which I think kind of created a level set of sorts and, and got everyone on the same page, which I think is good. Exactly. And that actually is a perfect segue into the process, which is what you asked me too. And that was really just, we looked at all aspects of a retailer's presence. So they had to have an app, a website, and a special designed mobile site, and then a store, a physical store to see how they could work together. So those were just the basic requirements for them to even be considered for this research. And we ended up starting with 99 retailers this year. Last year, we started with 75. And we just were really looking at, yeah, how they're integrated, how they're connecting and working together, but then also how you could use each platform individually as a consumer, because that's really important too. And even though omni-channel technically means channels working together, the reality is that for any individual path to purchase for a consumer... Sometimes they're just using one tool and they're sticking completely with that and staying completely digital. And sometimes they're just using the physical store still, even though it is 2022. And I'm glad that you mentioned that we clearly defined Omnichannel in the report because it was really important for our methodology to have two components. The first component being a consumer insights survey. And we surveyed 415 US consumers for that. And then the second half of the report is an actual industry analysis where we get to our top 10 retailers. So we started with 99, we then got to 23, 
that made the cut. And then we did a very in-depth analysis on those 23 to arrive at our top 10. And I get really excited about is really just the beginning part of the report, which paves the way for the second half of that research or that industry look. And the reason I love the consumer insights so much is because to your point, you know, we're designing all of these exciting platforms and channels and ways for consumers to enter and interact with a brand. But if it's not resonating with actual consumer behaviors, what's the point? It's money wasted, time wasted, resources wasted. It doesn't really matter. So I'm really passionate about that consumer insight section. And that's where a lot of the provocative nature of the report is actually kind of buried. So I like that part of it a lot. (laughs) I love provocative. So let's get into some of the the consumer (laughs) stuff and then we'll get into the assessment of those brands and retailers, which I always love to see that grid with all of the scores. It's fascinating. So to that ends in the consumer component of the research, it was noted that 68% of consumers actively seek out retailers that offer omni-channel experiences. I was sort of surprised by this. I don't know why Mm -hmm. exactly. I don't know if I'm like (laughs) expecting less of (laughs) other people outside of the industry. But I mean, can you offer some insight into what that assessment process is like? Because I know you noted on the retailer side that you had like certain checkpoints or check marks that they had to have from a channel standpoint. So was it the same for consumers? Right. So what we did for this question in particular was, first of all, we waited through a lot of the consumer insights questions. We didn't want to define omnichannel before we asked a bunch of behavioral questions because we didn't want to bias their responses. And so towards the end of the consumer insights survey, we asked them about a definition of omnichannel, and I'll share that definition in a second. And then we just said, after we've defined that, true or false, I purposely seek out retailers who offer omnichannel experiences. So we were able to see just how do you feel about that as a consumer now that you know how we're defining omnichannel, and we defined it as when a retailer provides opportunities for online, and we said, for example, website, mobile site, app, and the physical store to be leveraged together or at different times when purchasing an item. So we really wanted to do it from the perspective of the consumer, not necessarily the perspective of the retailer, because we want to speak the consumer language when we're asking those types of questions to really gauge. We want self-reporting to be as accurate as possible because you know there are a lot of pitfalls with self-reporting. So we asked the true or false, and 68% said true with that definition. They are purposely seeking out retailers who provide an omni-channel experience that way. Okay. That added level of context is super helpful because I agree the flow of the conversation or the survey really dictates outcomes. And I think people (laughs) don't really think about that. Like it's really easy to kind of let your own bias lead and that Mm -hmm. can definitely impact outcomes. So thank you for walking through that with me. And I think it really ties to one of the key points that we're brought up in the executive summary, which is essentially that omni-channel capabilities are essentially table stakes at this point, you know, just given the sheer number of consumers that are actively looking for these capabilities. But there's still an opportunity for retailers to make improvements, eliminate friction, and improve the connectedness or, or level of connectedness between those channels. And I'm wondering, and this could be just based on your research or even just your own personal experiences and conversations with retailers. Do you think the events of like the past year or two have kind of created this urgency to improve this integration or have like tensions in like supply chain, availability, all these other things happening? Have they created more tension? Like I'm curious, like how you think things are right now as a benchmark versus say last year when you did the research? Yeah, I think they've created even more of a sense of urgency. This perfect storm of labor shortages, supply chain issues, inflation. I think all of those issues that have really especially surfaced over the last year from 2020 to 2021. I mean, 2020 was really the year that Omnichannel became an actual thing. Retailers have been talking about it for so long, but they didn't have curbside pickup. They didn't have in-store pickup as mainstream and consumers weren't adopting it at the rates they started to in 2020. So 2020 kind of solidified omni-channel as being a thing that consumers were ready for, they needed it, they wanted it, et cetera. But I think 2021 definitely 
created even more of a sense of urgency around being good at it. It was one thing to just offer it in 2020 out of dire necessity. 2021 was like, okay, you're offering it now, but you have to offer it well because all retailers are offering it. So if you really want to differentiate yourself and really want to earn consumer loyalty, you have to be the best at it. And that was really demonstrated by the stark differences in our audit from last year and this year. So in 2020, we had a very different set of top 10 retailers than we did this past year. And what was just really cool to see was that I mentioned that we started with 75 retailers last year. This past year, we started with 99. And it's because so many more retailers offered all of the capabilities that were just bare requirements to be a part of the survey. But then even to get down from that large number of 75 or 99 to the 25 or so to then audit into the top 10, we had to implement a 95% cutoff rate. So I know I'm throwing a lot of weird numbers around. Basically, just what that meant was like, we did a mini heuristics evaluation in phase one to get to the retailers we would get to choose from for our top 10. And so many retailers were doing omni-channel so well that we had to say, okay, if you didn't achieve a 95% score in the mini heuristics evaluation, then you wouldn't make the cut to even be considered for the top 10. And we didn't have to implement that last year because... Yes, a lot of retailers were offering omni-channel capabilities, but they weren't doing it well. Interesting. So, yeah, accelerated that for sure. Okay, so there have been improvements, which I think yeah. is good news. <laughs> significant. <laughs> yes, significant. Yeah. And I, I also just think the stakes are even higher because to your point, there's so much tension now. Consumers are at their wits end with the supply chain crisis and just inventory stockouts that you really have to compensate in other ways and omnichannel allows you to do that. So I do think it's a perfect storm of tensions that are actually forcing even more urgency than 2020 did. And I'm glad you brought up just, you know, the benchmarks from 2020 versus 2021 because I agree 2020 it was like move as quickly as you can, stand the thing up and like, let's see what happens because we just need to do it. And this was the year I say this, meaning 2021, was the year to kind of assess, find opportunities for improvement, make further investments where where it was needed. And it was definitely a very interesting evolution because I feel like usually that path to progress is so long for certain companies. So it felt even more significant because everything felt a little bit condensed. And one of the companies that I personally have experienced and have enjoyed really tracking is Target. And I know they were at the top of your list this year. They beat out Nordstrom, who took the top spot in 2020. Mm -hmm. Personally, I'm not really surprised by this, just given the rate of investment and the rate of focus that we saw from them, especially in the area of fulfillment you know, mobile app integration, those improvements for inventory availability, like there was a lot going on there. And it kind of aligned with a lot of the issues that we were seeing come to the forefront. But I'd love your take. I mean, what were some of the key areas where you really saw Target clearly differentiate based on your analysis and the key areas that you were assessing? Yeah. So this is the less glamorous side of the research that it doesn't get me as excited just because it is so predictable. And you and I said at the beginning of this, we like to be provocative. And I think that's why we get along so well and why we're always commenting back and forth on <laughs> LinkedIn on each other's posts, because we go really out of the box. I think that's how innovation happens in retail, because it can be a bit of an echo chamber. But the reality is that Target just makes everything. And I mean, every single part of the path to purchase easy, right? Like, there is no friction. I dare anyone to find friction along a target path to purchase. And I wish the answer were more exciting than that. But to my cousin's point, because I had shared the research with him and I, I was like, I'm kind of bummed because there aren't really any surprises when you see that it's target at the top. And he was like, well, that just means your methodology is really sound. And it's true. I mean, there's they specifically scored 100% in the categories of search, buy, fulfillment, and returns. And we measure wow. across, yeah, seven categories. So they aced 
four out of seven categories and the categories that they didn't ace, they were still in like the 90th percentile. So I had a really nice experience the other day, actually returning one bookshelf. I had purchased three and we only ended up needing two. And it could not have been easier in terms of using the app in a physical store, showing them which order it was, and then just clicking on the quantity and clicking one. And when you think about something like that, where usually with a return, you're returning all or you're returning nothing, they've made this kind of weird gray in between of, no, I just want less of something, even really easy to return. And I know that's so niche, but these are the types of things that matter to consumers is also, you know, there were pictures of every single item I had bought over the past multiple months in my order history. So it could be very visual, very easy for me to figure out what I needed to return without remembering the SKU or the name or whatever. And so I I think they just really treat their shoppers like people who are not catalogs and they don't expect anything of their shoppers that is unfair to expect. And I think a lot of retailers still do, even just friction points of when you're going to make a return or to purchase something and you swipe your credit card and then you still, if you want a digital receipt, which I always do because I always lose paper receipts every time I have to re-enter my email. But at places like Target, at places like Home Depot, who also scored really well in our research this year, you don't have to do that. You don't have to re-enter anything over and over again. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I consistently have a really good experience at Target. That's why I spend so much money there. Right. Um, <laughs> Takes all my money. But, and I, I, I do want to go back to your point that it was kind of musical chairs with the top 10 this year. Only three of last year's top 10 made it to the list again this year, which I think is a really interesting point that I want to double click into a little bit. Is this the case of just the fact like you brought up earlier, like there are just so many other brands catching up and doing it well. Were there any last year's winners? Maybe they like lagged in a couple of areas. Like I'm curious if there were any key takeaways or points that kind of led to this, this particular shuffle of the top 10 that you think is worth noting for the retailers listening that maybe want to kind of pinpoint areas of opportunity and areas of improvement? Yeah, it was kind of a shakeup, which was interesting. So the three this year that were in the top 10 last year as well were Target, Home Depot, and Walmart. And I think those aren't really surprises to anyone, but I I love Home Depot, which I never really thought I would say because I'm not a handy person that doesn't really suit my, I'm not even crafty, but (laughs) they always make the experience so positive. So I don't think they get as much of a shout out as they always deserve because they also do a lot of things really, really well. They and Apple, both the Apple store actually ranked second in our report this year and, and they were not in the top 10 last year. I don't even know if we were able to review them last year for a few qualification reasons. But Apple and Home Depot both had really wonderful comparison tools baked into their websites. So you can click on a few items and just right alongside each other, compare them on things like price and then all the different specs, which, you know, those are big ticket items oftentimes that you're buying at Home Depot and at Apple. So it is really cool that they enable that and allow consumers to not need to click into a bunch of different windows because on a phone, you're not really likely to do that. So a comparison tool is really important on something like a phone where you're not opening multiple tabs. So that was one thing that I thought was really worthwhile to highlight. And then a few other brands that were sleepers last year that really shined through this year were DSW, Nike. I mean, Nike is always cool from a loyalty perspective, but from an actual shoppable experience, they do some very great things in their app right now. And they're also doing some interesting loyalty convergence in some of the retailers that they have a presence where they're not D to C. So I think that's just definitely the future of loyalty programs and very cool, similar to what Target and Ulta is doing with their merging of loyalty programs when you buy like Ulta products in a Target, for example. But Levi's also was one that I just really wanted to call out because they have such an aesthetically pleasing user experience. It is so visual and shoppable. And they also really double down on the loyalty component by 
offering exclusive launches or early assortment or even just exclusive content to members of their loyalty program. Because I typically wouldn't recommend, I wouldn't guess that a consumer would download a brand's app if they're not a mass retailer or they're not a big box retailer because you're only shopping that one brand. And so realistically, how frequently are you actually buying a pair of jeans, for example, from Levi's? But they optimize this idea of people wanting exclusive content and they've turned their app into almost a content platform. And and that just shows me that they understood the assignment in the sense that they're kind of competing with social commerce, for example. So they're treating their app like social commerce. And so is Nike, which I think is very cool. Yeah, I love that. And I loved your point earlier about the Home Depot and Apple and how they have tools like easy comparison. I know I'm seeing a lot more of social integration into product pages, which adds an added layer of like context, I think, you know, especially if you're trying to understand like, okay, how is this going to fit me or look on someone with my body type? I think that is extremely powerful. So as we're thinking about, I know in the report, there was a spotlight on these very visual and customizable experiences. So it seems like the opportunities to differentiate kind of leads into the content, the variety, you know, how easy to digest it is, how easy to consume it is, but also that it's personalized, that it's easy for me as a consumer, Alicia, to go into my account, see my preferences, see things that I've shopped or I've liked in the past so I can have a better experience. So that seems pretty easy to identify. Like, Because when I saw Apple, Levi's, and DSW spotlighted, for instance, I felt like they had very distinct value props for Mm -hmm. their consumers. (laughs) You know, like they had something very specific to bring to the table. They were able to customize based on that promise, which is great. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, well, how can this be translated to, say, a big box retailer or a mass merchant, for example? So do you think that it is possible that some of those differentiators can be carried over and applied? Or is it maybe a bit more difficult on a mass scale? Yeah, I actually think it is possible. And I would love to see mass merchants and and big box retailers figuring this out a little bit more. I think what's interesting is mass merchants really, and big box, what they lack is what DTC brands possess. And that's consistency in things like sizing or fulfillment experiences. One thing we noted in Walmart's fulfillment experience was if you ordered from a brand that wasn't like Walmart branded furniture, for example, or or something along those lines, the rules of how it could be fulfilled were very different. The returns process was very different. And so that lack of consistency, especially as more and more retailers become marketplaces, is extremely frustrating and extremely confusing for consumers. So it would be really wonderful to see these retailers who are carrying so many different brands, just establishing more consistent methods so that consumers can have really predictable, reliable experiences. And I I think they can get there. I think, especially with like sizing tools and stuff like that, if they could just communicate okay, this isn't our owned brand, but this size is equal to like for Target, for example, you know, this size is equal to this size in Ava and Viv or whatever. And so I think they could do things like that. Similarly, the design or aesthetic components are just so visually pleasing with DTC brands. And one of the few areas where Target was actually docked points was the website can just get a little bit kind of cluttered and chaotic and same with Walmart. And it's it's because they have so much merchandise, right? So they can't really streamline it like a Levi's can. But then you look at someone like DSW who carries all sorts of brands and they've figured that out. They've made it just a really streamlined experience. So I do think that it's definitely possible, but I think it probably requires a lot more heavy lifting than these big box or mass merchants want to partake in. But I would very much encourage them not to shy away from that because it is those details that don't even feel like little details to consumers. They really feel like important accommodations so that they can have just a frictionless, not noteworthy experience. Like they want it to be as easy 
as possible. And I, I used to be so excited about making e-commerce and digital as experiential as possible. But the reality is we just want to get in and get out if we're virtual, because a lot of times it's a convenience type purchase or it's a research oriented type purchase. And we want a retailer to facilitate both of those desires for us. So consistency really matters. Yeah. And I could imagine it's a very tricky balance sometimes, right? Because you were talking about like the Levi's mobile app, for instance, and how it's become almost a content platform, which I think is so fun. And I think there's a lot of opportunity there, but it's like, okay, how do you provide that depth of content and depth of experience in a way that the app still feels distinct and meaningful that people do actually want to yeah. download it and keep it mm-hmm. or, you know, not let it go off into the cloud and you have to like re-download it, but still alleviate that urgency or that need for something seamless and easy for the consumer. And I, I do want to make sure we get into that app experience in particular because I feel like this is such a point of contention and a point of debate. Like, do I need an app? Do I not need an app? And if I need an app, like, what do I do? Like, why do I need it? Like, how can I make it meaningful? And I know 41% of consumers that you surveyed said they prefer to shop through a retailer's mobile app, which which I found very interesting because we were talking about like easy, fast, seamless. But when I think of app, like you're in deep with the brand. So right. can, you, can you kind of explain this, break this down for me? I mean, like, is it because brands are doing it better? So it's like a cycle or is it that like, that's where the consumer is. So brands are trying to invest appropriately. I'm curious what you're seeing. Yeah. I actually love talking about this because this is where I have changed my mind most over the past few years. So years ago, I remember I would get this question from retailers, do we need an app? And I would say, absolutely not. Don't even think about it. You just need a strong mobile site. Don't ask me this, like (laughs) forget about it. And now I'm like, you probably need an app, most likely. So, and the funny thing is that brands, especially like Levi's and Apple, aren't the typical brands that I would recommend having an app in the first place because those aren't really brands where you're doing a ton of repeat purchasing. And so I think where consumers have gotten a lot more comfortable with downloading apps is where they're recognizing, okay, this is a very frequent behavior for me. I'm not shopping at Target once a month. I'm getting very honest with myself. I'm shopping at Target once or twice a week. Let's be real, you know? And that's why I need that app. And so, and I think Starbucks really paved the way for consumers in that sense. It was one of the first apps that consumers got really comfortable downloading. And it was because I'm buying coffee every single morning and I'm not going to kick this habit anytime soon. I might as well make it really convenient for myself. So there isn't as much of a need necessarily for a brand like Levi's or for a brand like Apple to care about convenience with consumers because it's not as much of a habitual purchase process. But that being said, there are still so many transactional components to buying a pair of jeans or buying a pair of AirPods, especially from a research perspective. You really do want to know that you're making an informed decision, whether that's in the way of sizing and fit and wash and fabric, or if it's along the lines of are these going to actually fit my ears or are they going to fall out during a workout and how long is the battery lasting and stuff like that. So I think convenience looks a lot different for some of these bigger ticket items. And so it's not about, oh, this is a habitual purchase or this is a constant relationship I have with this retailer, but it is a really meaningful one. And that's really now becoming the purpose of an app is to acknowledge that you have a meaningful relationship with your consumer and you can provide value that a physical store can't. So that's where that content piece comes in or exclusive information that you wouldn't get just by following them on social media or just by popping into a physical store, signing up for genius classes or learning more. I mean, there's just a lot of different aspects to all of that. So it's interesting to me. I think one, consumers are really ready for apps now because they've started to accept, okay, I make a lot more routine purchases in general than I ever wanted to admit. And I think Amazon has played a huge role in that acknowledgement as well. But then two, retailers are getting good at apps. They're actually understanding what consumers want out of it and understanding where they can provide added value that they couldn't get anywhere else. 
A hundred percent. I love that idea of turning the app almost into like its own mini community, if that makes Mm -hmm. sense. Like you have your social platforms as like their own communities, but it's almost like the mobile app is the destination for the people who really, really love the brand. And like, you have to tailor the experience accordingly, right? Like whether that's like exclusive drops or like getting first dibs on like new collections or exclusive access to sales before it's released to everyone. I guess almost sort of using it as a component of a loyalty program or a loyalty strategy, because I mean, that's like, again, the app is like an intimate direct connection to the brand. I feel like more so because you get the notifications, you get the alerts. There's like that added level of connectivity that you get versus say, like just going to a mobile site. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's really interesting in the DSW app in particular, you can use your phone when you're in a physical store to scan the item and do self-checkout. So that's a great example of, okay, it's a little bit more transactional. It's not even experiential, but it's heightening my experience in a physical store. It's making it easier. I would love to see a brand like Zara do that because their checkout lines are always right. horrendously out the door. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like just figuring out how you can create that meaningful connection with your shoppers. What do they need from you that they can't get in any other way? Megan Fox's stylist, like Maeve Riley has just incredible fashion and she did a collaboration with a fast fashion brand and she launched it early on the app, like earlier than she would on the website. And I downloaded the app. I didn't keep it, I'll be honest, but I did download (laughs) the app. (laughs) And I, you know, if there had been more value there, I would have stayed after I made my purchases or after I just saw what was in that launch. So yeah, I mean, retailers are figuring it out, but that's exactly it is they have to almost create their own channel that adds something elevated above a social media account or a mobile site presence. Awesome. Well, before we close things up, I do want to make sure we touch on fulfillment because that has been such a hot topic over the past couple of years. And again, since we're thinking through the lens of the next stage of improvement or, you know, the phase of optimization or however you want to describe it. Like we're at the stage where people are like fine tuning things, perfecting things, finding ways to differentiate. And an interesting finding from the consumer standpoint is that they said they preferred in-store pickup versus curbside. Is this an area of opportunity for improvement or should retailers just focus on like what the consumers are saying they want right now? Because I'll be honest, I would feel like the curbside side of things would be a bit more significant. So, I mean, where do you think this is going? That's what I would have thought. I was so confused by this. I really spent a lot of time (laughs) (laughs) thinking about it because I love curbside pickup. I think it's funny because this is another one where I actually have changed my mind. I used to always say consumers don't want curbside and they don't want in-store pickup because if they're going to the physical store, they'll just shop and they'll buy. And if they're going online, they'll just shop and they'll buy online. But obviously the pandemic created this use case for both services, but especially curbside that just makes so much sense. And now it's become kind of ingrained and embedded and appreciated within our routines. I mean, curbside just mentally makes so much sense for me in the sense of if you're in a hurry, you can grab it and go. But I think the only way I can kind of make sense of this is that consumers are thinking, well, if I'm going to the physical store in the first place, I might as well just go in. And the reason they're doing this omni-channel fulfillment approach is because they just get guaranteed the inventory. Whereas if they just show up to the physical store looking for it, especially with the stock out rates right now, there's no guarantee that it'll be there. So, and in fact, there's usually the guarantee that it won't be there, unfortunately. So I think it's really one of those where it's just, well, I'm going out of my way anyway, so I might as well go even further out of my way and enjoy it and and see what else is there or make it a little bit of an experience. But I think, I, I think there's two sides to this. I think there's opportunity then for both to improve. So in store, we noticed some definitely snags in the experience with some of the retailers in our connected report, just in the sense that you would go into a physical store to pick up the item and it would take, if you were in line, you know, if there were other people doing the same thing, you really did have to wait. Curbside, at least I think, you know, you're in the comfort of your own car and you're parked so you can make a phone call or go on social media or do whatever else, do some work, do whatever else you need to do. 
but a lot of retailers only have like two spots reserved for curbside. So I think there's also that lack of predictability there. Like if I pull up, will I even be guaranteed a spot when I do that? Or will I be circling for a while and trying to figure it out? So I think there's some room for improvement there. I also love to look at what the QSR space is doing to get inspired in retail. And Domino's has been doing that two minute guarantee with their curbside for a while now. It's worked really well. And if you don't get someone out to your car within two minutes with your pizza, you get a free pizza or a free order. And I would love to see retailers doing something like that as well. Because I think if there's no guarantee that you won't be waiting for a long time, it's like you might as well just go into the physical store. So definitely some room for improvement in that sense. I would also on a technology side, love to see notifications from retailers for just when the best time is to drive over and just, you know, Hey, here's a traffic alert. Cause I know your address, you're coming from this direction most likely, or give you a chance to say where you're coming from and, and let you know, and it might not be a convenient time to do either one in store or curbside. Here's when we recommend both that the store is less busy and there's less traffic on the road. So I think there's a lot of opportunity here to just use some geo targeting and, and geo technology that we tried to adopt years prior that didn't pan out. Like I think this is where there's actually a really rich opportunity, but yeah, I don't fully know what to say because I don't agree with our respondents on this one. (laughs) So (laughs) I'm just the messenger. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And I like to think about like, what is the next stage for this? Right. And and I a hundred percent agree. Like things like notifications and just like having that open line of communication and transparency with the consumer. So everyone knows where everyone is going and where to go. Like I've tried to do curbside pickup and like, there's not a dedicated spot for it. And it just gets very confusing. The parking lot is confusing and it's tight and it it becomes frustrating. So I get that. But like also the opportunity of like, what's next? And like, How can the person who's bringing the order out make that experience a bit better? Is it like a pre-pickup chat conversation? Like, oh, just wanted to make sure you didn't need anything else and like enabling global commerce. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like there's so much there that we haven't really, we've like barely scratched the surface on curbside. So I'm agreeing with you. I don't know if I'm on (laughs) the consumer side here, but (laughs) we will see. Right. And actually, well, to your point, Home Depot does give you a mobile number to text when you're doing that to talk to them and message them. And I love that. I think it's so smart. And also it just reminds me again, like love looking at QSR to get inspired. And I was trying to pick up food from California pizza kitchen, which is just embarrassing to admit, but it is what it is like a month (laughs) or two ago. And they had messed up the order, but I did curbside. So I didn't actually know till I got home. So I do wonder, (sighs) right. If that's something that's maybe happening here a little bit for consumers too, where curbside is just such a hurried experience that maybe they don't feel like they're able to check on their order properly and they're able to kind of take stock of, did they get everything they needed? Is is it all taken care of the way they would have wanted? So I don't know, maybe it just feels like there's a little less control in the handoff that way. Just something to think about, but I have no idea. Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah, like the entire journey, not just like, okay, you got the order, good luck to you. Like there's like all the stuff that happens after. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. All right. This has been amazing. I feel like we can go on for like another hour. 100%. But um, (laughs) I do want to encourage folks to check out the research. Again, we'll leave a link to that in our show notes so folks can check it out and dig into all of the data. But to kind of round out our conversation, again, we spoke about so much, all of the key findings on the consumer side and, and the actual strategies and investments on the retailer side. And I want to circle back to your point that overall, like the scores were higher this year. You had to like reassess the judging process or the assessment process because there have been so many improvements, which again, very exciting. But what were some of the key takeaways for you? What were some of the areas of refinement that were maybe needed, opportunities for improvement? Because really, I I just wanted to distill some takeaways for for the listeners right now around, you know, like things are better. Yeah, this is great. But like, where should they be focusing on moving forward? Mm -hmm. So I think the big thing is details are not tiny. Details matter and they make a big impact with consumers. So there were several things like if you were trying to figure out if you wanted an item to be shipped to the store or shipped to your home, for some retailers, it was really hard to figure out which was faster. And that really matters. So even just showing the comparison of timelines 
between the two so that they don't have to try to figure that out or make a decision before seeing that comparison. That's something that we didn't see many retailers doing. We didn't see any retailers allowing for multiple people to pay for an item. So from like a gifting perspective, I just think that's really important, especially as we start to think about where are the learnings for the next holiday season too, of being able to split things. And we know that shopping is such a collaborative experience now because of social commerce. So just really facilitating that. It was infrequent that I think there was only one retailer that allowed you to change the configuration of an item on the cart page. So before you had even committed to buying it. So if you wanted to change the quantity or change the color or change the size, you couldn't do any of those things. You had to either click edit and then see a different window, or you had to go backwards and do it again. And so these sound like really small things, but what the key is, is it all comes down to that friction again. So I would just say, really take the shopping experience yourself. Like if you work for a retailer, try buying things a million different ways and see where the pain points are because you'll find really teeny tiny ones and they feel really teeny tiny, but they're not to a consumer. That's how cart abandonment happens. And we have so many tabs open and and we have this massive consideration set now. The whole world of retailers is just existing under one roof that any little slip there there's a ramification there for consumers. They will go somewhere else. And that's not to say that consumers are necessarily less loyal, but it's just, they have so many options today and they're well-informed and they can take advantage of having all those options. So that's what I would say is look for those details. They make really big waves in the customer experience. A hundred percent. Well, Melissa, thank you again so much for taking the time out to chat with me. Again, we have so many conversations offline, <laughs> yes. so it's good to have a record of it. It's going to be formal. It's going to be out in the world now. Um, yes. Again, thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I always love talking about this stuff with you. You always have refreshing insights and points to bring. So thank you for challenging me. Ditto. And to all of you, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you have any follow-up questions for us, please do drop us a line. As you know, we share this content on LinkedIn and on Twitter. So contribute to the conversation. You can find us at our touch points on Twitter or on retail touch points at LinkedIn. And of course, encourage you to follow Melissa as well. She's always sharing such incredible content and perspectives on the latest retail news. So again, check out the show notes so you can follow her. And if you like what you hear, subscribe to the show. We are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, frankly, anywhere else you can get a podcast. We are likely there and leave us a rating and review. Thanks again, everyone for joining us and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of Retail Remix. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can find us on your favorite podcast player. Until next time, keep mixing it up.